the foundational principle of Christianity in itself, the very reason that we are all here today is because Jesus said, with loving kindness have I drawn them. And so the title of the message, of course, Love Never Fails. We talk about love and how love has the strength if we have a revelation of who God is and how his love is attributed to us, how we can then push that love outwardly and it becomes ministry. Love must first become personal to us before it can become an extension of who we are. Because we can say, see, love is an action. Yes, it is. And we're going to be getting into this a little bit later, but it says that God so, for God so loved the world that he gave. And so now if God had to stop that God so loved the world and he would have just said, I love you. We would have been left hanging with an illustration of how much he truly loved us or a revelation of what that truly meant or what it truly means to be loved. So we're going to go into the scripture. Of course, this is a familiar title. What's love got to do with it? No. <laughs> I'm dating myself when I talk about that particular title. But what's love got to do with it? What, what does love have to do with the ministry of reconciliation, the body of Christ, uh, being uh, in the will of God, being used of God, being a minister not only to those who are outside of our homes, it's particularly to those who are inside, inside of our homes, and then outwardly, what does love have to do with it? Paul gives a detailed illustration, and we're going to be starting in 1 Corinthians 13, 1, 2, 1 through 3. And one of the things that's interesting about what Paul does and how this, how this particular text is strategically placed be, be, be behind the very chapter that uh, 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 is before it, uh, is that Paul in chapter uh, 12 of 1 Corinthians talks about the gifts. And he goes in depth and he talks about, you know, the gift of prophecy in tongues. And he talks about all of these different gifts that are to be used within the body of Christ. But then he follows it up with love. And, 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 I, and I know that it wasn't on, 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 on accident because God never does anything on accident. It was that he was showing us that we may have all of these gifts and all of these inner workings and all of these things that we're able to do outwardly. But if love isn't our motive, yeah. it profits us nothing. Yeah. And so we're going to look at that today, and we're going to start in verses 1 through 3 in 1 Corinthians 13, in the 13th chapter. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but I have not love, I have become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Amen. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and I know that growing up and, and, and being, being young, you know, in church, I used to look at the people who who speak in tongues and have the different gifts and everything as being more spiritual. And I've somehow felt that because they're more spiritual, that there was a level uh, to them that I was not necessarily able to obtain, so to speak. You know, and what Paul is talking about here is he's not downgrading the gift of tongues. He's saying that if love is not the very foundation from which they're doing it in, then it profits of nothing. He says, though I speak with the tongue of angels and of men and, and men of angels and have not charity, which is love, I become as a sounding brass or tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all the mysteries and all the knowledge, though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains and have not charity or love, I am nothing. People don't want to know how much you know until they want to know until they know how much you care. It was it was Jesus who who went about. It says he went about healing and doing good. 
I heard a pastor once say it this way, I met the love of God before I met the God of love. In other words, his love reached out and then he became to know him. And it is because we reach out in love. Paul said it, I became all things unto all men that I might by some means gain some. So what does that mean? To the person that may like to play ball, I go shoot hoops with him. To the person that may like to uh, play pool, I go play pool with him. I sit with him. I talk with him. I develop these relationships in love before I maybe even mention the first scripture. Because now you have to see the love of God. We have to first believe the love of God. How many times have we heard someone get beat up with scripture, get beat up or, or cast down and everything, and, and they're run off from the gospel? They're run away from the church. They're run away from, from the, I, I feel worse when you, they say, I feel worse when I, when I, when I, when I, when I go to church than when, I, when I'm outside of the world, outside of the world. And that shouldn't be so. That shouldn't be so because it says, in verse 3 it says, and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor. Now that would seem like something good. That would seem like an act of love. And though I give my body to be burned, that's like sacrifice. Man, this yeah. is just, bro, he's, he's going out on the limb. He's going to do this until he gives his body to be burned. And have not love and profited me, profited me nothing. Motive. God is so concerned with our, our, the motive of our hearts and what it is that is our true intent. And, and, and Jesus, and I'll go into it a little bit later, it talks about in 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians 5.14 where it talks about the love of Christ compelling us, compelling us to do, to do the ministry of reconciliation, to love people. What is our motive? And asking God to give us true and correct motives. In 1 Corinthians 4, 1 through 7, Paul says something interesting, and it says, Judge nothing before it's time. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 7, we're talking about motives and in love and asking God to, 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 to give us revelation in that. Go ahead. Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found proof of faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by a human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself. For I know of nothing against myself, yet I am not justified by this. But he who judge, judge me, judges me is the Lord. Therefore, judge nothing before it's time until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the heart. Then each one's praise will come from God. Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively transferred to myself and Apollos for your sakes that you may, you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up on behalf of one against the other. For who makes you differ from the other? And what do you have that, will not, that you will not receive? Now, if you need indeed receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? Amen. Paul is talking to the church of Corinth. And as we're talking about all of those different attributes, uh, backtracking with, with, with 1 Corinthians uh, 13, 1 through 3, Paul talks about, so let a man account of us as ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. A steward. A steward is, is someone who manages, someone who is entrusted in something that is of great wealth or is of great importance. God has made us stewards of the mysteries of God. And it says, moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Yes. Being faithful means being faithful to the doctrine of love and that I'm ministering the word of God and my motive is love so that you 
would grow thereby, or if you haven't met Christ and you don't know him, that you would come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. One of the things that is so profound in the next verse, he says, but with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you, of man's judgment. Yea, I judge not my own self. One of the things that's in the gospel, uh, or, or, and it talks about this publican in the center, and the publican was the one who basically says, you know, I fast three times a week, and I pray, and I do all of these things, and he was kind of puffed up, because he was, he was doing all of these things outwardly that he thought made him look more spiritual, and the sinner wouldn't even look so much up to heaven. He was like, I am not, you know, he said, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And it is that mentality when we're ministering or when we're going out or when we're, when we're witnessing the people that people recognize and they can see. People can see when somebody cares about them. Right. People can, people can detail and detect when somebody truly and genuinely cares about the motives from the heart and just, you know, I'm just checking. I just want to know how you do. I just want to give you some encouragement. I just want to let you know that God is available to you through me. I just want to love on you in Christ. And so Paul is saying, for I know nothing of myself, in verse 4, by myself, yet I am not hereby justified, but he that judgeth me is the Lord. And it's not that we're not fruit inspectors. You know, fruit, fruit, is, fruit is definitely going to follow men and women of God or yourself and everything. You should be looking for fruits in your life. You know what I'm saying? But he's saying, don't take up that attitude of the publican and saying, and start patting yourself on the back and saying, yeah, I'm doing it. I, and then yesterday, you know, I went over there and I laid hands on the sick and I did all of these different things. He says, no, 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 no. It is a very small thing. It's not that we are to not admonish each other. It's not that we're not to encourage each other. But he's saying in verse 5, therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord come who will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. And then every man shall have praise of God. Sometimes you see people, and we, we were talking about giving to the poor, and that's why, you know, even when uh, uh, Jesus was talking about praying, he was like, don't stand on the corners like the, the you know what I'm saying, the, 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 the heathen do. You know, they, they're doing it to be seen. They're just standing and they're shouting and they're doing all of these things. And, and sometimes people, you know, they'll, 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 they'll go into homeless ministries and they're taking all these pictures and they're showing them, giving the checks and everything like that. The motive of their heart is not really truly for the people. It's so that they can be seen. It's so that they can receive some type of esteem, some type of place, some type of title. And God is saying, don't judge that before it's time. The reward is going to come. It says, in the hidden counsels of the hearts, and every man, and then shall every man have praise of God. Out of everything that we do, our ultimate goal, our ultimate objective to be able to say, to be able to hear Jesus say, well done, my good and faithful servant. If everybody, if I got a stadium of 100,000 people there, all shouting, you're the best taste, let's slice bread, and I get to heaven, and he say, depart from me, My God. which is, <laughs> which one is more important? <laughs> you know? And so, and in, in verse 6, he said, in these things, brethren, I have a figure, I have in a figure transferred to myself to Apollos for your sakes, that ye might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written that no one of you be puffed up one against the other. That was an issue in the, in, in the church in Corinth, and he, and he even talks about, you know, some say you're of Apollos in another, uh, another area of scripture in Corinth, Corinthians. He said, some say you're of, 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 of Cephas, and some say you're of Paul. He said, but you're all of Christ. You know, he was, they, were, they were dividing themselves, and they were saying, well, I'm over here, I'm of Paul, I'm of, and, it's, and it's just like today. You know, we have denominations. But those denominations should not stop the work of Christ, should not stop the, the, the ministry of, of moving forth. You know, I, I was just, there was a brother who, who was just here earlier today, and one of the things, he, he's, he's, a, he's a young pastor, he just started on everything like that. He's like, let me know when you're going out in the community. I say, I like that, brother. Let, let, let's go together. We got two different ministries, but we got the same ministry. We got two different titles of ministry, but we got the same ministry of reconciliation. We got the same common enemy. What's the motive? Love. That's all. That's it. And so it says for in verse 7, for who maketh thee 
to differ one from another. Differ from another. For what hast thou, for what thou, what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now if thou didst receive it, why doest thou glory as if thou hast not received it? He's talking about grace. You know, grace and, and, and salvation. And, and, and sometimes, you know, that's why Jesus, I mean, or the, the Bible says in, in uh, Ephesians, and you have the quicken who were once dead in your trespasses and sins. It's taking up that mantra, that mindset, that, 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 that ideology that when we're witnessing or when we're telling someone about Jesus, that we present it in the, in the sense to where we let them know, listen, I was once where you was at. Matter of fact, I'm not there all the way. I am not well. In other words, we're new creatures in Christ. The Bible says that we're delivered from the penalty of sin, but we're ever being delivered from his power. There are some things that I have to continuously work out. There are some things that I continuously need to pray on. There are some areas in which I need to get better. I, can know, I can't beat my chest like the public and say, well, I fast three times a week, and I pray, and I do all of these things, and I'm not like the other people. No, I can't never do that because there's always so much more to, to grow. And I tell, I tell brothers and sisters, our mark is not each other. Our mark is Jesus. And so if my mark is Jesus, oh, my goodness, I got a long and I will never get there. That's why Paul says, I press towards the mark of the high calling in Christ Jesus. I press. I'm not there. I forget those things which are behind. So yesterday, sh today should be better than it was yesterday, and tomorrow will be better than today, but I'm ever growing in the love of God, in the ministry. And so Ephesians, I don't have this up here, but it's, you know, I'm going to go to uh, Ephesians 4 and 15, real quickly. Just to add to that. One of the things that we're called to do is speak the truth in love. Yes. Speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head of, which is the head, even Christ. What does it mean to speak the truth in love? It means to, doesn't mean to sugarcoat, doesn't mean to make it sound pretty, doesn't mean to, to, to you know, to call people when they're headed over a cliff. I gave that illustration a, 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 a month ago or so, you know, but it's to genuinely, when the Holy Spirit gives you a word, you speak that word and recognize who you're dealing with. And that comes with relationships. There's people who God will give us discernment and say, you can't say that to them in that way. You can't say that to them in this season. And they're not ready to deal with it. They're not ready to handle it. Paul even talked about this, the, the early Corinthians. He, he said, listen, I can't even speak unto you as spiritual. But as a today, I don't love you any less, but I can't talk to you like this. I can't give you meat right now. I got to continue to give you milk because you wouldn't be able to handle it. And it's just no different than you wouldn't give a baby a T-bone steak. It might be good for him when he grows up. He still might be able to, but his digestive system, his ability to digest and understand what is going on is not developed yet. And so we don't hold off completely from saying anything to them. We just give them what they need for right now. You might want steak. And you might look at it. No, 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 no. I'm going to give you this milk. And this milk is going to help you grow. And so speaking the truth in love is also being able to tell somebody something that they may not necessarily want to hear. We're so afraid of, of their faces. He told Jeremiah, and I, oh my God, I, I feel for that. You know, Jeremiah had a rough ministry. Yeah. Everywhere Jeremiah went. Yeah. The people was like, man, if you ain't got nothing good to say, Jeremiah, don't even come around here. I don't want to hear it. And Jeremiah like, man, God, you know, I... He didn't even want to preach. He said, I was weary. I didn't even want to preach this. But he said, it was like fire shut up in my bones and I could, I could not contain. I had to do the will of God. And so as to be able to tell people in love, listen, you're going down the wrong path. You're opening the wrong doors. You're around the wrong people. You, 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 you're in the wrong area. I would want someone to tell me that if I was lost. I would want someone to tell me that if they see something that is detrimental to me, if I pick up a bottle of water and they know that it's poison, and I would want you to tell me, hey, you about to, you about to drink something, put that bottle down. What do you mean, put this 
bottled down. No, well, you might not want to drink. It might not taste too good and everything. And I end up, well, that's a soft answer, so I'm going to go ahead and drink this because you act like you ain't even convinced that it's dangerous. So, no, being able to speak the truth in love means being able to tell people, thus saith the Lord, even when they don't want to hear it. Even when they don't want to hear it. And so we're going to talk about some of the attributes of love because love does have attributes. And love is an action. And so in verses four through eight, we're going to look at some of those, some of those attributes. It says in verse four, it says, charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself and is not puffed up. Love goes through some things. It suffers long. Uh, there's a saying I used to hear the old folks uh, say, and they would say uh, when I was when I was a little boy, they was like, "People will visit you when you're sick, but just don't stay sick long." <laughs> <laughs> and I and I was like, "Okay, what is it?" Uh, later, I got the video and said, "You'll see." Right. Oh, you gonna have flowers, cards, calls, everything out there. That first two, three weeks, yeah. let it go on a month, That's two right. months. And you'll slowly start to see the people drop off. It's the same way when people pass away. You got every support and everything. Oh, sorry for being lost. We're here for you. Just call me and everything. And then everybody's right there. Yeah. Two, three months go down the line, crickets. Uh -huh. Charity suffereth long. And that's dealing with people that are necessarily who have personalities that are not necessarily pleasant. Mm -hmm. yeah. We've all had to endure some unpleasant people and, and God is, and we still have to because the ministry, and Jesus said, I ain't come for those who, uh, who are well, I come for those who are sick. So if it's some sick people, guess what? I got to go around them. Yeah. Right. Even if I got to put on my, my, my little mask or whatever, and not get that, I, I, I got to go around them, so to speak. And that's, that's, a, that's a metaphor, so to speak. But I'm talking about someone that may still be cursing, Somebody that still may be getting drunk, somebody that still may be getting high. God said, yeah, I called you to go over there and deal with them. And so that's love. Because, you know, I've been in some, some, some places and heard some conversations. My spirit is free. It's like, oh, God, Jesus, could you just say something else? Say something different. It's, 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 sometimes it's family. But love suffers through that for the ultimate, ultimate motive of being drawn or drawing them to Christ. It's kind. That's a word today that you can walk in any store or, or any fast food restaurant or you can go to any uh, place where you need customer service and you'll know that kindness is definitely not something that's common. But God has called us to be kind. And sometimes even kind when we're being rude to. That is such a temptation. It says a soft answer turneth away wrath, but see now, we can say a soft answer turneth away wrath, but our actions though, our actions have to be demonstrated that a soft answer turneth away wrath. And, I, and, I, and then it's not easy. That's why we need the love. We need God's love. We need the love of God. God says it's an anchor to our soul. So what does that mean? When someone's trying to blow me into a direction to where I'm going to say something, that is contrary to what the word of God said, Lord, help me stay rooted in the love of God. Help me not to say the first thing that comes to my mind when I'm, when I'm being attacked or I'm being uh, 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 come against. And it says, in charity, envy if not. That's jealousy. That's, 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 you know, there's nothing wrong with aspiring to be like someone or, or saying, you know what, I want to be able to do that, you know, one day. But it, there's, there's that uneven balance when it's, when it's, when it's out of will of God when it becomes fleshly fleshly envy you know and God warns us against that charity brought it not itself and it's not puffed up in a verse 5 does not behave rudely does not seek its own is not provoked thinks no evil does not rejoice in iniquity but rejoices in the truth bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. 
But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. Amen. <clears throat> Love did not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh not her own. It's not selfish. Jesus says something so profound in Matthew 25. I want to say it's right around the 25th to 28th verse. And he said to the effect that I did not come to be served, but to serve. I did not come to serve, but to serve. And that's unselfish. That's what love is. Agape love is selfless love. It's a love that it, it, it doesn't look for anything in return. It's just doing it because it's its very nature. The very nature of it just says, I'm just going to do this because I love you. And so in serving, you know, today, unfortunately, in, 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 a, lot of, in a lot of churches, it, it's, it's the reverse. Serve me. Why is the lights well? Why is the praise team doing it? Why are they playing my song? Why is it this? Why do I have refreshments? Why ain't there nobody to? And this and all these other things. But then when you ask, hey, can we go? We going out here on uh, Saturday? We finna go out here. Oh, brother, I got something to do. I got this. And all of these things because they didn't come to serve. They came to be served. Because serving says, I'm going to take up the selfless attitude that. I may be on the way, I may be on my way to heaven, but there's so many other people on their way to hell. So I have to love them beyond what I'm even seeing and beyond even what I'm hearing or beyond what I'm feeling and endure some things. It might be some hot sun I might have to endure. It might be some sore feet I have to endure. It might be some time away from maybe I wanted to play some video games today or go out here to the mall or go shopping at this, that, that. I'm going to sacrifice. Like Jesus, God said, for God so loved the world, we're going to talk about that scripture that he gave. The intent of his heart was that he loved the world. That was, he was saying, this is what my intent is. To what, to what extent? To the extent that I'm going to give you the very best that I have. Yes. It says, it says it's a reasonable service. He says that, 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 that be, not, be, be, conform, be not conformed to this world, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And it basically, he says, this is our reasonable service. Even if you do all of these things, that this is just reasonable. That's, 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 you, you, you did something that well and good, my faithful servant, you did what I required. And that it goes back to that, that, that verse where it says, moreover, it is required of stewards. Why is it required? We've been entrusted with the word of God. We've been entrusted... It would be no different than if there was, in Noah's time, a flood about to happen. And we all had our passports. We good. Listen, another 10 days, it's going to be over with, man. Listen. And so we got our passports. We're going on the ark, and then we don't tell nobody else. And God is saying this. Not, no. it, it, whether, whether they receive it or whether they reject it or whether they're indifferent to it, still... Go out and tell them and let love be your motivation. Yes. And so it seek of not its own. It's not selfish. It says in verse 6, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in truth. Yes. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in truth. It don't run out the gossip, strife, or drama. Amen. We let, oh man, you just turn on the TV and you can see Housewives of Atlanta, whatever you you change, whatever channel you turn on, it's got all of this different drama. And there's some things, you know what, movies and everything are entertaining. That's not necessarily what I'm what I'm what I'm speaking on, but it's that constant seeking of some type of drama. Drama seekers like, oh, what did she say to him? What did he say? Then let me go over there. No, I'm gonna find out because I don't know. She ain't gonna talk to him like that. I'm gonna, and it's like that constant, no. God is saying love don't do that. Love seeketh the truth, so love would seek. To be a peacemaker. God said, blessed be the peacemakers. For they shall be called the kingdom of God. Not the drama makers. He said, blessed be the peacemakers. So if we're contributing to drama, then we're not acting in love. And God said, no, but rejoiceth in truth. Rejoiceth in truth. 
And it says that it beareth all things. It endures some things. And, and, and it believeth all things. And it hopeth all things. It endureth all things. Believeth all things. It takes love to believe the best in some people. Even when you're looking at the worst in them. I love this song by Marvin Sapp, and I had it played at the installation. He saw the best in me. Yes. When everyone else around me could only see the worst in me. Yes. And because we are the body of Christ, we are God's representative in the earth. We're the ones who are supposed to be seeing, and not just seeing with our eyes, but telling people, you know what, brother, you got this, 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 and this. Don't, don't, don't. Absolve yourself of the duty to be able to speak the truth and love and to be able to minister to the people in our family and the people outside of the world and be able to tell them things that we see that are wrong, but don't neglect to tell them what's something that's good on the inside of them. There's something good in every, we, we, we can say, you know, what? Well, he ain't nothing. No, there is something. And we need to be able to find that and be able to minister to that because I find that some, most of the time, even, even with children, you know what? You sure rake that grass good, pretty good. You do, you know you. And the child like, okay, wow, I do. I, wow, you sure sweep that floor real good. Boy, you, you really good at that. And it, and it, and it, and it's encouragement. That's love. You know, not absolving the fact that okay, you might need to clean your room, you might need to do all of these different things. I still gotta tell you that in love. But I'm still going to give you something in love because I believe. In all things, I believe that God is able to change you. I believe that God is able to turn you around. I believe that God is doing a work in your life, even though it doesn't look like it. See, that's what we have. Sometimes it don't look like it. Lord Jesus, does it not look like it? Sometimes, you know, you're like banging your head against the wall. You're trying to minister to this person, maybe a family member, maybe be a friend. And you just banging your head against the wall thinking, Lord, it ain't. don't say that. I believe that God's doing something in your life. I, I believe that he's working something. I believe that he's turning some things around. Because now, we talked about last week, death the light being in the power of the tongue. God said, let there be light and there was light. We have the power as ambassadors, as children of God, to speak light. We are like God, made in his image and his likeness. We have his power. We have his authority. We have the ability to change the atmosphere. David, with his heart, when Saul was being tormented by this, this, this evil spirit, he played with his heart and the evil spirit left. The centurion told Jesus, you know what, John, I'm not worthy for you to be up underneath my roof, but just speak the word only. And I know my servant shall be here. He spoke the word and the servant was healed the same. Now, he's given us that same ability, that same authority. We can speak what not we see, not necessarily what we see, but what we believe. And what we believe has the ability to change because what God saw was darkness. But he said, let there be light. And it came to pass. It was light. And so in verse 7, it says, I read that. Verse 8, it says, love, the title of the message, never fails. It never fails. God cannot, that's the one, God cannot fail. God cannot lie. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Faith cannot fail. It is unbreakable. The reason why sometimes uh, 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 things go awry or, 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 or people don't mend, you know, friendships or things like that is sometimes it's just unreconcilable differences, you know. But love cannot fail. And it says in 1 Corinthians 13, 9 through 13, For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. And now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. 
and now abide it by faith, hope, love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. Amen. For now we know in part and we prophecy in part. That's just, that's just saying God is so big we cannot contain our, our, our brains would, would, would explode if, if we can contain everything that, that, is, if that is in God. For, for we prophecy in part. There are some mysteries that God has yet to reveal to us that, that you know, we, we, I have a saying, you people, I'm quick to tell you about saying why, I don't know. <laughs> God ain't saying, you know, there's some things in, 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 the, in the word of God that God says, no, it's not, it's not yet needed to be to know that, you know, just, just trust and, and, and have faith, you know, and, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which shall be done in part, with that which, then, excuse me, then that which is in part shall be done away. One of my favorite verses. When I was a child, I speak as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things, spiritual maturity. When I was a child, I spake as a child. Love, speaking the truth in love. We can experience the same thing, but respond to it differently depending upon our level of maturity in our love walk. We can respond to people differently. Whereas one person might cuss the person out, we'd be like, okay, I'm just going to deal with it. You know what? I'm going to love you anyway. I'm going to push past this. I can do that. Jesus, when they were nailing him to the cross, and Jesus was not murdered. Jesus gave his life. But he said something so profound, and he spoke it in love. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Nails being driven in his hands and his feet. Thorn on his head, and he did nothing but bless them. As a matter of fact, the very ones that were doing it to him, that's who he was dying for. So for him to be able to say from the motive of his heart, Father, forgive them. Sometimes people cut us off in traffic, and we ready to, you know, we ready, <laughs> we ready to forgive them. But nailing your hands to a cross, and while, why not after? Like you just you dealt with it, you had some time to go away and heal and then deal with it again, your prayer club. No, while they were doing it, yeah. Father, forgive them. Yeah. That was love. Yeah. It says, I understood as a child. I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things, something that the Holy Spirit gave me yesterday, and I wasn't even in study. He talks to me. Throughout the day, he'll drop a little nugget, and I'll just stop and I'll just type it in my phone and this, that, and that. One of the things that we have to be careful of is when we're loving on people, whether it be family, whether it be friends, whether it be our, even our own children and things like of that nature, we have to recognize that there comes a point where we have to understand that we can't be the very source of their happiness. We have a discussion, you know, the problem. Well, what does it mean to be blessed? What does it mean to be happy? And I said, happiness is an emotion. You can be happy one moment, and then the joy is something that storms of life, trials, people can say stuff about you. You can be going through whatever it is. Joy is a constant. Joy doesn't necessarily mean I have a smile on my face. It's just an inner piece about me that says that I'm all right. Yeah. And I'll tell people I'm going to be all right. I'm going to be okay. And so that's that constant, but that's not natural. That's supernatural. That's God stepping in and saying, giving us eyes have not seen. So that means you can't see it. Ears have not heard. No, entered into the hearts of men the things that God has appeared but he has revealed them unto us in our spirit. So while other people are looking at stuff that's going on around us, we got something on the inside of us that still declares, despite what they see, everything's good. I'm blessed. I'm good. I'm, I'm okay. And so I said that to say this because God said we cannot be someone else's happiness. Yes. Even in relationships and you're talking about, you know, it, it takes two whole people. You know, uh, if I was a half when I came in and he was a half, we made up a whole. No, 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 no. Wholeness. You have to be wholly happy because now what happens is in the, sake of, in, in, in the instance of a child, if we become the source of their happiness, then we set their spouses up to be the source of their happiness. And so now I'm looking to man to make me happy. 
I'm looking to man to fulfill my joy and I'm setting him up for failure. No, I can contribute, I can help you, I can love on you, but it's some stuff you got to, speaking the truth and love, it's some stuff you got to deal with on your own. It's some stuff you got to fight through. If you're unhappy and you're going through this wave or cycle or whatever, that's some stuff you got to deal with. You have to be able to love people enough to be able to tell them that. And I'm sure the apostles, even people call, you know what I'm saying, and the prayer is that there comes a time where you, you, you got to be able to pray for yourself, brother. You got to be able to pray for yourself. So you got to be able to get this firm foundation underneath you because Jesus told his disciples, I'm not always going to be with you. Yeah. I'm not always going to be with you. I need to get you to the point to where you're able to pray for yourself, where you're able to tap into this yeah. same God and find joy, same God and find peace. Same God and be able to be anchored when the storms of life come. Yes, because they're coming. Trials and tribulation come, but when we're anchored by the very God of love. And one of the things that, that is that is so important, and I, I went through this, you know, years ago. I had this, the enemy had me tripped in my mind. I, I knew that I loved God. But because I didn't see any outward manifestation for what I was praying for, I kind of felt like he didn't love me. All right. And we get like that. Yeah. We kind of feel like, well, God, you, you did it for so-and-so, and you did it for that person, but what's up? And you talking to God because you got that relationship, you're like, what's going on? And so, in a dream, I asked God, and I was crying in, in, my, in my soul, and I, I don't know if I mentioned this in the book or whatnot, and I was just crying, I was just crying. And I said, I asked, I said, Lord, I love you, but, but do you love me? He didn't say yes or no, it was just like he didn't do in the Bible. So many times people try to ask him a yes or no answer, if Jesus, John said, is, if Jesus, is you the one, or should we send for another? Jesus, the blind see, the lame walk, and the deaf hear. That's your answer. And he said to me, I will take care of you. Mm -hmm. And through these years, that constant reminder that he will take care of me, although it may not seem that way, children of Israel going through the desert, manna, and all of these pillar of fire by night, and, and, and all of these different things going, it didn't seem like that, but God was still taking care of them. I don't know, no pair of Nikes and no pair of Reeboks that if you walk around the desert in them for 40 years, they ain't going to wear out. Right. But those shoes did not wear out. Right. And so that was God illustrating his love. And so in that, I recognize that I can never get myself to the point to where I'm looking at my circumstances or what I'm going through to determine whether God loves me. And that's growing up. When I thought as a child, I spake as a child, I understood. I was understanding as a child. I was understanding love on a superficial level that had to do with my circumstances and situation. And God says, no. Matter of fact, he told me, I'm not going to change your situation. I'm just going to change the way you deal with it. Yes. I'm just going to change the way you deal with it. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were putting the fire in furnace, but the fire had no effect. The fire had no effect, and people were astonished. And God said, that's an illustration of how you're not going to look like what you've been through. There are some things that I'm going to take you through, but you're not going to look like it. And the people are going to be as you went through what? You was what? What happened to you? And they're looking for the example, or they're looking for the outward manifestation of you've been through a fire. And there's not going to be one. Because God has the ability to preserve us. And so, in the perfect illustration, in closing, of that love, and I talked about it at the beginning, a very familiar verse in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God... And he just didn't say, for God, love the world. That one little word, so. so. Yeah. He so. so loved the world. Poet. He so loved the world that he gave. He gave. 
Giving is not necessarily monetarily, it's giving of our time sometimes. It's, it, 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 it's not necessarily giving up your time when the person is present. When you go off in your prayer closet and you take two or three minutes to pray for somebody else, that's love. That's love. When you, when, you, when you take time out and you say, you know what, Father, bless them, bless their house, encourage them, build them up, keep them protected. That's love. So God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever, that was the other part of love, that whoever, he didn't make it to where it was a certain category of people, a economic status, or a race, or anything. He said whoever. It's a gift. And I gave this illustration a few weeks ago. Basically, we're all on death row until we meet Jesus. And Jesus steps into the courtroom and says, I know you're sentenced to death. And I know that you're guilty. But, Your Honor, I'm going to take this place. You go home, live your life. You'll be blessed. You be happy and go out there and you just you just do you because I'm gonna take this <clears throat> punishment for you. And that's what he did. And he didn't do it for just somebody and everybody that's in the courtroom. He did it for him. He said, All of y'all can go. I got you. Everybody that will receive this going. Now some people are still sitting in the courtroom. Some people are blind to the fact that they're sentenced to death. And so now Jesus is saying, You who have been free, convince these other people that they need to leave too. Convince these other people that they need to get out too. And that's love. That is love. And so, in closing, we know that the love of God is something that has attributes. And we saw those attributes and we saw that God not only said that he loved us, but he demonstrated it. And he showed it in so many different ways. He showed it in so many different uh, areas. And that we know that <clears throat> even in having gifts, gifts don't necessarily mean that we're somehow on this other. No, God is saying the, 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 the foot of the cross were all the same. And so it's with that same mindset. He said, let this mind be.